Good afternoon, everybody. Really pleased uh, that you're joining us today for our second uh, virtual access event focused on the historic and really unprecedented federal stimulus package. Uh, first off, I hope that you, your colleagues, uh, your family and friends are staying safe and healthy. And on behalf of the DSA, we really extend our gratitude and deep thanks to the incredible healthcare workers and first responders, our city and county and state partners that are working so hard every day to fight this virus uh, on our behalf and to keep our uh, community safe. Um, seeing all those empty sidewalks and empty streets in, in downtown uh, is a bit bittersweet. Uh, we're in the business of filling those sidewalks up and creating a healthy, vibrant downtown 24 hours a day. Uh, but seeing them uh, quiet and empty shows that we're all doing our part as a community uh, to distance ourselves, uh, to help our businesses, nonprofits get through this, get our economy back, and importantly, protect our healthcare workers. Uh, but I've been a proud Seattleite the last several weeks and watching how we've responded and, and proud of uh, the fact that we've got great healthcare uh, providers and uh, great researchers as well that are on the front lines of this looking for treatments and, uh, and a vaccine. Uh, so we've got a great panel lined up today to really um, take apart the federal stimulus package that was adopted uh, last weekend, um, a historic $2 trillion effort uh, we want to help you understand as small businesses and nonprofits how you can best take advantage uh, of the resources there. Uh, we're going to start with Frank Lowenstein, who is the director of APCO Worldwide's Washington, D.C. office and joins us today from uh, Washington, Washington D.C. A uh, great member of the Downtown Seattle Association, the APCO office here in Seattle was really gracious to connect us uh, with Frank, who's uh, been on the ground there as the federal stimulus package came together. And it's gonna give us some insight to the architecture of that uh, package, how it came together, and also uh, to the best of his ability, look forward uh, as far as potential for further federal action. Uh, welcome, Frank, and, and maybe just first briefly let us know what's life like in DC right now? Huh. Thank you very much, John. It's a very, very strange time to be in this town. We're, we're used to uh, a lot of hustle and bustle, I need just to say in Washington, uh, um, uh, lots of tourists come in, of course, but also there's all the federal employees are are congregated in a pretty dense area downtown, and and that place is deserted right now. Uh, you can drive around uh, and not see another soul for blocks and blocks and blocks. One benefit has been a great time to teach my daughter how to drive because there's nobody for her to crash into. But other than that, it's just a very very strange environment to exist in right now, and I think that's really relevant to uh, uh, how this CARES Act came together. It's, it's really difficult to, to describe just how, how challenging it is to function in anything approaching a normal way when, when a lot of people can't even come into the office. And so when it came to the CARES Act, we, we obviously everybody in Washington and all around the country understood that dramatic action was necessary by the federal government uh, uh, to begin to address the, the economic uh, 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 crisis that was unfolding before our eyes. The problem was uh, that there was just no time to go through the normal processes that one would go through in order to pass legislation of that magnitude. So what you had was a, a $1 trillion a CARES Act a bill that was set out by a, a Senator McConnell on behalf of Senate Republicans last Wednesday. And, and then following on top of that was a, a negotiation with Democrats led by Senator Schumer that resulted in the addition of another trillion dollars. Just think about that for a second. They added close to a trillion dollars to this legislation within about a 36 hour period, right? And then after that, they had to write it all down, which they did uh, uh, largely over the course of the weekend, and then pass it, right? But you, you, you might wonder how is it that everybody can think of all the different things that we would need to think of to spend $2 trillion effectively? And the answer is you really can't, right? So I think Tom will have a lot more uh, uh, insights into how this is actually working on the ground. I'll be, I'll be uh, uh, curious to hear them myself. But the one thing to understand is that due to the nature of the process that resulted in, in this legislation getting passed in such a condensed time period, there really aren't answers yet to a lot of the questions that, that folks in the real world are going to have in terms of accessing these funds. So that process is going to have to play itself out. Uh, over time, I know the Treasury Department is actively soliciting questions. Uh, uh, folks can send questions into their uh, a congressman. They have the ability to pass those along to Treasury Department or the Small Business Association. 
but the, 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 the uh, challenge is going to be processing the sheer amount of loans uh, that these guys are already receiving and all the different qualifications uh, that would normally have gone into being a small business, right? That nobody has really had an opportunity to think through whether all of those eligibility requirements uh, uh, still hold, right? So uh, uh, just bear in mind that everybody in this town, Democrats and Republicans, really doing the best they can uh, under unbelievably difficult circumstances, but people should have realistic expectations uh, uh, about just how comprehensive this legislation really is in terms of the, uh, the actual app application and implementation of it. The one thing that's very important to understand is the intent behind the bill was to protect American workers, right? So uh, uh, in theory, at least most companies, big and small, and I'll, I'll, I'll go through the two different main buckets of money uh, in a second, but uh, the, the, the theory here is that most companies should be at least potentially eligible for relief under this bill, right? If they are having a, a, a difficult time managing their business and really keeping their employees on their payroll, right? As a result of the COVID crisis. So you have, uh, I don't know whether we can go to, to, to my slides here, uh, just real quickly. There's uh, really two main baskets of, of money here. One is for uh, larger distressed businesses. And uh, you can see here, there's a, there's a very quick rundown of it. Uh, $500 billion made available for big companies uh, and, and really for liquidity on an industry level basis through programs that will be administered uh, by the Federal Reserve. Um, 25 billion of that is earmarked particularly for commercial airlines, right, uh, for, for obvious reasons. Then there's 17 billion, uh, especially set aside for companies that were critical to national security, right? There's some rumors going around Washington about uh, who that's intended for. Uh, I won't get into any uh, details on that, but uh, that's probably money that is that is uh, uh, has a recipient already in mind. And then there's four billion dollars for air cargo carriers, right? But the rest of the money, 454 billion dollars, is is available for all other businesses above 500 employees, right? And there there are are, are certain eligibility requirements, which again are really unbelievably vague. It, you know, you can't have applied for money under other provisions of the bill. You have to be a U.S. domiciled business, have the majority of your employees in the United States. And um, you know, beyond that, everybody is really eligible to apply. The, the Secretary of the Treasury, uh, Steve Mnuchin, has an, an extraordinary, really an unprecedented amount of latitude in deciding which companies are going to get that money. And I know from conversations that we've had with folks at the Treasury Department, they're asking the same questions you would be asking if you were at the Treasury Department, which is who most needs this money in order to keep Americans on their payrolls? Right, and so that will be a a a, a, a a process that you know the Treasury Department will be overwhelmed with that, right? But they are trying to get as much money out the door as quickly as they can. They had 10 days from the passage of that bill, which I think will fall on next Monday or Tuesday, to promulgate specific regulations uh, for who is eligible and and how they should go about applying. So hopefully we'll see those coming out uh, in the near future. The thing to understand about the distressed businesses loans uh, for larger businesses is that they are not forgivable loans. Those are, are real world loans. They need to be at market rates. They need to be properly collateralized. And that, that is a function of the fact that uh, in the past with the TARP bailout that we, had, we saw about 10 years ago, uh, there was a lot of concern that, <clears throat> that maybe that money went to companies that were using it for uh, perhaps stock buybacks and, and excessive employee compensation or whatever the case may be. So there's main safeguards with respect to that money are, are related to ensuring that businesses use use it for what they're supposed to use it for, and that they uh, pay it back at fair market rates as, as soon as they are able to. So we can go to the next slide. And then I think what's, what's probably of, of, of much more interest to folks here uh, uh, on this call is the small business loans. It's called the Payroll Protection Program. And this bill was really, uh, this, these provisions really came out of work Senator Rubio has been doing for a long time on behalf of small businesses. And again, this applies to, to companies with 500 or fewer employees, uh, including nonprofits. And I know we have a bunch of non nonprofits on the call here today. And again, you can get that money. It's up to $10 million. And you can use it for, uh, if you use it for things like keeping people on your payroll and, and basic operating expenses, then those loans are forgivable. And that's a really important distinction between the larger companies and the smaller companies here. These are effectively forgivable loans provided uh, uh, well, the amount of them that you use for those purposes, keeping people on payroll, uh, mortgage, interest, that sort of thing, that 
uh, that will be forgivable, right? And so uh, uh, people should be applying for those things um, you know, as soon as they possibly can. I saw a note from one bank today that they'd already received over 10,000 applications. And as I mentioned before, Tom uh, uh, can go into much more detail about how that process is actually working and what the criteria are that they've been uh, given by the Small Business Association. But uh, the idea here is, again, to get money out as quickly as, as, as the government possibly can uh, for small businesses in order to allow them to keep their employees on their payroll, right? Uh, there is also a, a additional provisions with respect to the emergency economic injury disaster loans. Those are $10,000 loans. They can come, uh, uh, they're supposed to be granted within three days. I, I don't think that's going to be happening right now. I think the SBA will not be uh, in a position to get those out in that amount of time. But again, if you're under extraordinary duress, uh, you can get up to $10,000 uh, very quickly. And you know that is eligible, uh, nonprofits are eligible for that as well. And I think that will, uh, um, that, that program should be set up uh, uh, straight away. Um, then I'll just take a, a quick second to talk a little bit about wh where we go from here. I think there's a, um, a lot of questions surrounding whether there really will be a second stimulus bill. I think for, well, it would, in fact, it would be the fourth stimulus bill. And the way the process unfolded here, the House of Representatives really had nothing to do uh, with the drafting of this bill. It came almost entirely, the CARES Act did out of the United States Senate. I said it was a negotiation between Democrats and Republicans there uh, that really excluded the House. Uh, the House then had to pass the bill, of course. And so in order to, I think, get the House to agree to that, there was an understanding that the House of Representatives would have its own opportunity to, to be the original drafter of the next stimulus bill. So the House of, of Representatives and the Senate are both out on what we call recess uh, until, I think, April 24th. But I know that there's already a process there uh, to begin examining what kind of things might go into that bill. Uh, we've already seen some political jockeying there. I think there are some uh, folks in the House who would really like to take this as an opportunity to, to include a lot of programs that uh, they may not have had the opportunity to get passed uh, in prior days. And now that there's so much money uh, available, I think that there will be an effort to put as much stuff in there as possible. Uh, and there's already been some pushback on that. So I think that process will play itself out uh, over the course of the next uh, month or so. But I think it, it's reasonable to expect that there will be uh, uh, what will be the fourth major stimulus bill. I just don't know uh, exactly how big it's going to be and exactly what the timing will be on that. Um, so I'll stop you without happy to answer any questions. Who do you feel got left out of the first one? Um, what sort of, what's the thinking on, on the next set of investments or is it too early to tell? You know, I think a lot of what they're doing right now uh, um, as this process is unfolding on the ground is hearing from folks who were left out. Why were they left out? Did they get tripped up on some eligibility provision that was a holdover from regulations that weren't really intended to apply in this kind of situation? I know the Treasury Department is actively soliciting input from uh, companies with respect to anybody who may have fallen through the cracks on this. Right? Again, just to, to think of it in the simplest possible terms, people really are trying to do the right thing when it comes to keeping Americans employed with this act. They know they didn't get everybody. What they don't know is necessarily who they didn't get. So it's really up to companies around the country, large and small, right, to weigh in and say, hey, my employees are going to be impacted by this. I will have to lay workers off. The intention here is not to exclude any workers, uh, any real Americans making primarily less than $100,000 a year, I think is where these things are focused. But in any event, I, I think if there were gaps there that they hadn't thought of, uh, I think there's going to be uh, every effort made to, um, uh, to address those. I think there's also going to be a lot of special interest, candidly, uh, who are going to be weighing in on this. Uh, honestly, as a, just as a taxpayer, I'm, I'm, I'm a little nervous about how that process is going to lay out. You're talking about spending trillions of dollars uh, uh, in a very short amount of time when, when there isn't really the normal process of having committee hearings, right? Having a really close vetting over who's getting this money and why. Hopefully they can do a little bit more of that next time. But I promise you that the retail industry, or the tourism industry, some of the specific industries that have been hard hit by this will be going to Congress in the next month and saying, hey, listen, I didn't get all the, the relief that I really needed under this. I am particularly hard hit. My employees have been particularly hard hit. I will be forced to lay off thousands and thousands of people if I don't get a specific provision this time around. So I think that there is some good that will be done over the course of the next month in terms of, of, of accumulating information that, that people need to try to make sure everybody who deserves to be covered was covered. I think we're all, those of us who worked in this town, a little concerned uh, that there's also going to be some folks that don't really need the money but are just very well plugged in 
uh, politically are going to try to get their hands on as much as they can. So in some ways, it's, it's business as usual in Washington. There's, there's some good and there's some bad. If a fourth package does come together, Frank, what's the soonest you think that happens? You know, I, I can't imagine that this thing will, would be done before the middle of May, right? Uh, I think that would, that would be the earliest. Um, but again, you know, it, it's really hard to predict exactly what the impact of this is going to be on the economy. I think th there is the ability to move sooner uh, uh, than that if strictly necessary. But I, I think the general prevailing view is $2 trillion ought to carry us over for a month or so, and then we can start. Uh, on the next round of money. What will be interesting to see, you know, some Democrats are talking about doing an infrastructure bill, uh, which there's been a lot of, of support for in the past, and to try to shoehorn that in as, a, as an employment program uh, to address the, the, the impacts of the crisis there. We'll see if they get any traction on that. I think that they are really just in the initial stages of sorting all of that out. But yeah, I think the earliest you would see that would be the middle of May. In fact, I think it's likely to drag on well, appreciate the front uh, line insights that you bring from the from the other Washington, and I, I imagine there will be questions from you as we get into our Q and A session. I want to move now to AJ uh, Kari with the city's Office of Economic Development, a great partner of the Downtown Seattle Association over many years, and AJ is in the position of helping uh, small businesses access uh, and nonprofits access uh, the the relief and funds that were included in the stimulus bill and also helping all of us understand the economic impacts to the city of Seattle uh, to date. And I want to just start there, AJ, and ask you if you can give us sort of a thumbnail of some of the data that you're tracking around unemployment, layoffs, and general economic impact. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, this has certainly been devastating for the businesses and the economy, not to mention the health of our communities uh, locally and globally. It's hard to you know, wrap your head around that. Um, the impacts we're feeling here are the same that are felt in you know, friends in Japan and Australia. It's, uh, it's crazy. Um, uh, but the impacts are certainly felt broadly and deeply um, locally here. The stay at home has had, um, order has had a number of effects. Um, layoffs um, in part. Uh, I was looking at the State uh, Employment Security Department report, uh, the, their last one. Um, unemployment soared to a record 100, uh, un unemployment claims soared to a record 182,000 last week. And to put that into perspective, that's, that's seven times the peak that we had uh, in the 2008 9 recession. Um, and so these these layoffs are especially affecting the low-wage workers. Um, and uh, I saw a report uh, from Community Attributes that they said that um, most of the jobs that are affected by the layoffs are around the 38,000 um, salary level. And so that's really, those are a lot of um, you know, vulnerable um, employers that are now laid off. Um, and businesses are really concerned for former employees not being able to pay rent um, as much as they are themselves, the businesses themselves. Um, so this has just been really tough all around. Um, City is also tracking, uh, trying to track closures. Um, and while we don't have a complete picture yet of things, what we've identified so far, um, a, at least 100 temporary closures of businesses. Um, just they're not sure when to reopen yet um, based off of, you know, the recovering economy and the stay home order. Um, and we know of at least 11 permanent closures that, that we've tracked. And I'm sure there are others that are, that are out there that um, we haven't heard of, too. Um, we've also, uh, the city has also had more than 1,100 permanent events that have been canceled to date or indefinitely, indefinitely postponed. And that includes events like the Rock and Roll Marathon and, and every single event at the Seattle Center for the coming months. Uh, so it's just huge to think of all the trickle down impacts from that um, with tourism and um, you know all the uh, you know secondary economic effects of that that are just that are that go away with those cancellations. Mm -hmm. Farmers markets have been closed um, indefinitely. We're trying to figure out how to reopen those in such a way that it's a compliant with with health uh, with the current health codes um, so that we can maintain food resources for people and have revenue for local and uh, farmers. So. This really hits everywhere, basically all businesses, all the industries. Um, uh, but, you know, businesses are trying to adapt. Uh, there's a kind of a glimmer of hope with, uh, um, you know, restaurants switching to takeout and delivery. We've seen a lot of success stories around that. Um, uh, working from home, 
Um, everyone should be pros with their uh, mute and unmute buttons by now. Um, you know, so just this uh, adaptability, but you know, even with all of that, it's, it's still a scary time for businesses. Everybody's hurting and, and sadly, many businesses will, will not survive. Um, this is just, you know, folks only have um, a few weeks of cash on hand. And so when that, that goes away, these, these loan resources um, and grant resources will be increasingly important for, for folks to rely on for the recovery. Um, so, so impacts of this and recovery will definitely be long lasting. And so how are you and, and OED organizing yourselves to support small businesses and nonprofits in Seattle that are looking to access these federal funds? What can a small business and nonprofit is expect of, of OED over the next several weeks and several months? Yeah, sure. So that, that's always been our job to advocate for small businesses and get them connected to resources and networks to help them grow and, and adapt. And, and right now we're a hundred percent focused on getting them connected to the resources to help them survive. Um, so offhand, a lot of resources that includes uh, utility deferrals, you know, tax deferrals. We had a stabilization fund uh, and we, that had more than 9,000 applicants and at, at 2.5 million that was available and 10,000 a piece, we could only award to 250 folks. So we're, we're trying to figure out some additional funds for that. Um, but my big piece is um, helping folks plug into the, all the SBA uh, loan products. Um, and so that includes uh, like the disaster loan and, and advance, the 10K advance on that, express bridge loan, the uh, payment protection program and, and SBA relief. Um, we put together some staff to set up a call center that's going live today. And then I'll uh, work with GSA to share that information. Um, and it's a place where folks can call and inquire about uh, SBA resources and we can point them in the right direction. Um, we're definitely not any, uh, we're not uh, making any SBA underwriting decisions because it, it, these are all their products, but we can at least help them understand what resources are available, um, general guidance on how to interpret the rules around these resources, and then also help them navigate the application. Um, so right now it's mostly within the city, but um, several our, of our partners have reached out to ask how they can support um, their business constituents. So um, in the coming days, we're working to coordinate with others to share this information, um, train up folks, um, and then expand this effort so that other um, organizations can help support their businesses locally in their own neighborhoods and industries. So you're really positioning yourselves as, as sort of a navigator for small business and nonprofits and to quarterback uh, their needs and connect them to SBA and, and other potential products? Yes, yes, definitely. Definitely trying to stay on top of all the changing information, changing resources, disseminate that for folks, and then make sure it's accessible too. Right now, I know the SBA is only taking um, online applications. So how do we make sure that folks that need translation um, or other access issues, how do we make sure that those folks um, can access these, these resources? So we're looking at, at that with an equity lens as well. And when did you say the call center would be, would be live, AJ? The soft opening today. Uh, we just trained staff yesterday. And this is all fly by the seat of the, your pants, right? Because a lot of the staff that were on hand, you know, not everybody's comfortable with explaining loan products to people. So, um, you know, that's part of it too, is, you know, uh, focusing on training the trainer and then um, soft opening today, full, um, full access next week. Um, and then by then, hopefully we'll have a clear picture of, you know, what SBA lenders are available to, uh, to provide the PPP and, you know, other information that's floating around there. So we're excited to be able to help get this information out and plug in with others to, to, to get it out to as many people as possible. We'll be sure to share it out and appreciate you joining us for uh, this webinar. I want to move to uh, Tom Bazarski, the regional president of WAFED Bank. Uh, and also a member of the board of the Downtown Seattle Association, wanted to acknowledge that and thank you, Tom. Uh, the banks have a big role here in pushing out a lot of capital from the feds, mainly through the Paycheck Protection Program, $350 billion. And you've been 
um, paying close attention to this, Tom, over the last week, I know, and it's been a, a very dynamic situation. Before we dive in there, I, I just wanted to acknowledge and maybe ask you to speak to um, how WAFED first responded as a bank uh, in the early weeks of this uh, economic devastation. There were some additional, additional products and actions that you took to support mm -hmm. uh, small business. I, wish, I want to ask you to talk a bit about those. Sure. Uh, thanks, John. And, you know, before we, we, as we were getting our arms around the economic crisis uh, that's unfolding, uh, we're also dealing with a, with a health crisis. And so for a perspective, uh, we're headquartered in downtown Seattle with 2,000 employees spread across eight states. So just having to manage uh, that piece as well. Uh, two of our, our retail branches were in close proximity to the Life Care Center in Kirkland, uh, where we had a tragic outbreak of the coronavirus. So our first response uh, there was to just restrict access to our branch lobbies uh, and then begin to restrict access uh, to our branch lobbies throughout Western Washington and then all eight states. Um, we also took the steps of uh, setting all of our high-risk employees home uh, with pay through the middle of April. Um, that has since been extended now to the end of April. And all of our retail employees who were able to remain in the branches working are, are receiving a 20% or 25% premium in pay. And uh, we wanted to, to keep them focused and reward them. Um, but on March 12th, uh, we, we then were able to launch a lifeline for small business. And this was essentially a line of credit of up to $200,000 with no interest uh, for 90 days and no fees. Um, our CEO, Brent Beardall, was on CNBC discussing uh, that the next day. Um, he actually got a shout out on Twitter from Mark Cuban endorsing the program. So that was, uh, we're a bank, we're not used to shout outs on Twitter. Um, we also designed a payment deferral plan for our commercial and retail clients and, and restarted our mortgage resource center, uh, which is something we created uh, back during the Great Recession. Um, fortunately, our entire commercial banking team in Washington uh, set up to uh, work remotely. Uh, by coincidence, we're remodeling our headquarters downtown. So we were preparing to disperse everybody out in the field anyway. So we just accelerated that. So we have a fully functioning team to kind of facilitate and manage uh, this paycheck protection program. And, and that's just more luck than anything else. Um, so you fast forward now to today, and we've had the passing of this CARES Act and this Paycheck Protection Plan, which, which is a much better program. It's more of a forgivable loan program. It's administered through the Small Business Administration. And so Washington Federal Bank is a participating lender in that program. And so that's, uh, that's kind of where we are now. And, and we can get into the, I like the word unpacking what this is, uh, because there is a lot of unpacking to understand it all. Yeah, maybe help us understand what, what do we know today and what don't we know as far as how you as a bank and how businesses will access right. uh, these funds? Well, if you're anyone was watching the news last night, there was a lot of excitement and everyone was talking about this program going live tomorrow. So I think an analogy is probably the best, best way to describe where this is. There's a lot of anxiety and uncertainty surrounding this, this program. And so think, think of uh, an airplane basically being manufactured on the, on the runway trying to take off. That, that is literally what we have here. And it's, it's an unprecedented amount of, of interagency cooperation to try and streamline and cut out red tape so that funds can begin to flow as quickly as possible. Uh, last night, the banks uh, received a 31-page interim final rule from the Small Business Administration, which provided a lot of the clarity we were looking for on how to administer these loans. And, and I've, I've been underwriting credit for, for 22 years, and this, this is extremely loose lending, which is by design. The kind of what Frank was speaking to, the goal here was to, to get funds into the hands of businesses that need them as quickly as possible. And in order to do that, you've got to cut out a lot of the traditional underwriting uh, that, that you would do. So <clears throat> this is very much what I would call um, an honor system. There's a tremendous amount of money available but it's designed to get to those who really need it. And so that then is, is something that uh, I'd ask everyone to think about as they're trying to fill out these applications. This is, this is truly designed for businesses that need them. Anyone can apply and the banks uh, are required to get a certain amount of information from each applicant. And one of those things is, is, in, is the applicant must attest that they, that they truly need it and, and their business has been adversely impacted. 
Um, and that's, that's pretty much it. Um, let's see here. <clears throat> We've, we have teams working round the clock. So now we're talking about how do we actually implement this and when can funds flow? Applications uh, were scheduled to, uh, according to the SBA, where you could, you could start submitting your application today. Um, in, in, in practice, uh, we have been building a reservation list, which has about 1,500 companies on it uh, as of this morning. And that reservation list is, is, is as soon as we can launch the program, we're going to start contacting each client on that list and help them through the application process. One of the things the banks are trying to do is automate this as much as possible so it's much faster to process the loans and, and fund them. Uh, this, this is very much a loan, it's not a grant. Um, and so I would check your bank's website if you already have a relationship with a bank and see if they are participating in the plan. Not all banks are participating. Um, and so, uh, and then see if you're eligible to apply with them. Uh, we are participating, there are a number of banks in Washington and in Seattle that, that, that are part of this. Um, our leadership team last night spent, uh, at five o'clock, we assembled every, everybody and created a, uh, a frequently asked questions list very similar to the questions that many of you submitted to the DSA. So there's a lot of overlap there. And this, these are bankers sort of looking at this program. And I think uh, one of my bankers had a very good observation. He said, Tom, this is, this is literally like being given a pop quiz by our clients on subject matter that's being written in real time. And, and that, that's, uh, that is true to some extent. But we do know enough. And our expectation here um, is that we'll be, we're gonna be working through the weekend to continue building the process and we should be in a position to start processing the applications next week. That's our expectation. And we think we'd be one of the first banks in the country to have a, a system to do that. What's your advice, Tom, if, if there's somebody, a business or a nonprofit that uh, their business banking relationship was with a lender that is not approved? Is your advice come see WAFED or uh, what, and what's the prospect for uh, folks right. that have so, that existing relationship to get through the system? So this, this is a first come, first serve process and it is open to everybody. Um, that's, that's what is stated in the, on the regs. Um, in practice, um, if you already have a relationship with a bank, you've already gone through the customer due diligence and the bank knows you. And so just by being that far ahead, you'll be able to move through the application process a little bit quicker. Um, if you are a new client and we're taking new clients as well, um, many banks are, um, there's that added step of the know your customer and the BSA type programs. So the bank actually knows who you are, your company's a re legitimate company, and you have to filter out all the nefarious actors. And that takes a little bit longer to do that, but it, it's still going to be a fairly expedited process. There's no collateral, um, no guarantees other than uh, from the SBA. And our expectation is once you're approved, then the, the funding occurs within days, not, not weeks. And can you speak to some of the additional terms as we understand and know them today, as far as payback and interest rates and time periods? Yeah, I thought I'd, I'd pull up um, our frequently asked questions. And many of you submitted um, questions that are very specific to you and your situation. And some of those questions we also have as well as a banking industry. So, so even though the uh, Small Business Administration issued this, this 31 page um, clarifying document last night. It, it just, the banking industry is gonna go back and ask a few clarifying questions. You know, one of them, for example, is, is how do you deal with affiliate companies? So if you own multiple companies, how do you aggregate that to see whether you have 500 or, or more uh, employees? So simple things like that. Um, but let's go through kind of the frequently asked questions list that, that we built. Um, that's going to answer, I think, a lot of the questions. Um, we are also going to publish an external FAQ on WAFED's website. Um, and so that'll be updated uh, on an ongoing basis. Um, and so, but really, once you are able to apply and the system's built, your banker is going to be able to walk you through your specific situation and help you out. Uh, but let's go through some of these uh, some of these programs. So uh, this is a, a low cost loan, this uh, paycheck protection program. The banks are going to get paid a one percent interest rate, and that was updated from last night. It was going to be a half percent interest rate, 
and it's a two-year loan, and there's a six-month payment deferral. The amount that uh, you can qualify for, you take your average monthly payroll from the last 12 months um, and multiply that times two and a half. Let's see, can the loan be forgiven? Yes, as long as you follow the rules. So what are the rules? Well, the loan has to be used to cover payroll costs, and then it says most mortgage interest. Notice it's not principal and interest if you have an amortizing loan, it is just the interest portion, rent, utility costs, over the eight week period after the loan is made. Loan gets funded eight weeks from that date, all those types of costs um, can be forgiven. You also have to uh, maintain your employee count the number of employees and their compensation levels during that period of time. And, and then there's another qualified under that the SBA will be issuing additional guidance on forgiveness. So um, like I said, this plane is still being built here. Uh, there's no personal guarantee, um, no collateral. And for banks, and this is, this is also important. When we talk about interagency, you know, um, collaboration, um, the, the accounting world and the regulatory environment has also come to the table and, and relaxed the standards uh, for banks to modify loans and not have them count as a troubled debt restructure. Now, why is that a big deal? During the recession 10 years ago, if you were to modify a loan to make it easier for someone to repay, there was an accounting impact, a balance sheet impact to the financial institution. And you had to have that loan then became a non-performing asset on the bank's balance sheet. Today, those standards have been relaxed so a bank can modify that loan without having that adverse impact on the balance sheet. That's huge. Let's see. Uh, I'm just going to ask Tom, what's your, um, your sense of the ability? Sorry, the challenge of having so many things connected to a computer here. <laughs> is, is the lending industry um, equipped? I, know, to I have my, uh, my little command center set up here at, uh, at home and it's... Uh, it's actually a very short commute, and I, I kind of like that. I, I'm, uh, you know, this this trial of uh, working from home now and telecommuting. I think uh, I think there, there could be a fundamental change here in how, how people, you know, work work going forward. But different topic. We want to see you and your employees back downtown, Tom, in uh, on the other side of this. Though, so no working from home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was going to ask you: Is the what's your sense of the lending industry in, in this region and its capabilities? To push out this kind of capital to those who need it, and is there a, a throughput issue in your mind? Hang on a second here. Yeah. You guys hear me now? I can. We can hear you. I can hear you. Sorry about that. How uh, I got uh, distracted with my technology here. If you want to continue through your FAQ, okay. that's just fine. And I can come back with a few more questions and then we'll open it up here very soon to our audience. Okay, so going back, going back to the, uh, let's see, details on loan eligibility includes all nonprofits, veterans organizations, tribal business, sole proprietors, self-employed individuals, and independent contractors with 500 or fewer employees whose principal place of residence is in the United States. Important consideration. Um, <clears throat> payroll costs are capped at $100,000 on an annualized basis for each employee. And lenders are going to rely on certifications from the borrower in order to determine their eligibility and the use of the loan proceeds. Uh, you are not eligible if you're engaged in any illegal activity uh, under federal, state, or local law. So um, if you're in the marijuana business, that, that is uh, not one that would get approved. Um, if you're a household employee, you're not eligible, uh, or household employer, excuse me, like a nanny or a housekeeper. Um, a person owning 20% or more of the applicant has been convicted of a felony in the past five years, incarcerated on parole, probation, 
Um, and if you're currently delinquent on any SBA or federal loans or have defaulted in the last seven years, so there's some, some restrictions there. Um, when can you apply? Today is when everyone can apply if the banking industry uh, was ready for this. Uh, I expect, like I said, at Washington Federal, we should be able to uh, take applications next week and start processing them. Um, if you're an independent contractor or self-employed, um, you can start making application April 10th. And Tom, what if you're a, a business who had to lay off their employees how is your eligibility determined? Are you required to bring everybody back and then apply? That's a, that's a great question. Um, and that's one of those specific situations where, um, you know, we, we like to have that specific guidance because if we don't follow the rules and you as the borrower don't follow the rules, then the SBA's guarantee and the forgiveness of that debt all come into question. And so we want to be rock solid in giving the guidance to each applicant in their specific situation. <clears throat> And then and so you, that, that, that exact FAQ or question will be put on our FAQ. So, so as soon as we have the answer to that, we can put it in there. And then if you've already applied for other SBA assistance, are you still eligible for the paycheck protection? I, I believe so. I believe so. <clears throat> Great. Well, why don't we open it up to questions for our audience and we're going to try to do these by asking you to raise your virtual hand and then we're gonna unmute you and allow you to ask you to introduce and identify yourself and then um, ask your question and make sure you direct it to a specific panelist if you could. Uh, Emily will manage that. And if uh, we fail in that technical uh, approach, we'll do it the old fashioned way and uh, moderate the Q&A box. But we did wanna make this a bit more dynamic and invite you to ask your question directly of our panel. I see Howard Wright has a question. Howard, if you unmute yourself, please feel free to ask your question. Most people ask me to mute myself, so thank you for inviting me not yeah, to. Yeah. I have two really short questions. The first one's for Mr. Kari. With the reduction of, t of tax income for revenues to the city, how can the city, and I mean this in a hopeful, optimistic way, how can the city continue to fund and provide city services? And then in a second, I'll have a question for Mr. Lowenstein about affiliated companies. Oh, that's a, a good question, w way above me. Uh, but I believe I thought I saw in um, some language somewhere that um, municipal governments would be eligible for some of these, uh, uh, these benefits coming out of CARES Act. Um, we are also trying to um, work with other departments uh, to to network with um, uh, you know private organizations, corporations, foundations locally to to leverage private dollars uh, to support um, uh, programs like our stabilization fund um, and and get you know folks connected to as many of those resources as possible. So it is a, uh, a just as as an uncertain time for us as as many of the small businesses so we're, we're really right. trying to figure all of that out i had just seen you know with bno tax sales tax and property taxes funding the city and no business activity going on i could just see a cash squeeze right you know, out there somewhere thank you and for mr lowenstein there I, i'm not in the venture capital world but i do know that a lot of um, uh, small companies funded by venture capital, a lot of portfolio companies were at first precluded from being funded uh, through some of the CARES Act because they had been all been funded by, you know, large uh, uh, venture capital firms. And I understand that because there are obviously so many in Speaker Pelosi's district that uh, perhaps they were going to unwind some of the affiliated companies uh, rules and, and restrictions. And I'm wondering if you've seen anything on that. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much. It's a really, really good question. I was on a, a call earlier this week with a, a, a large private equity firm that has a, a whole bunch of, of uh, portfolio companies, and they were concerned about that exact thing. Uh, again, I think the, the answer is that they have not definitively determined whether rules that used to apply are necessarily going to apply here. So I think that the, 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 the best way to approach this would be to go to your local bank if you're talking about small businesses less than 500 employees here 
and and just be clear about what the what the situation is and and make a good faith application there and then uh, Tom knows far better than I do exactly how the SBA is directing local banks to make those kind of determinations. So I think it's a relatively fluid process. There, there's a second way, which is to get uh, 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 information to uh, uh, Senator Rubio's office or really to whoever your uh, uh, local representative is. I, don't, I think Senator Cantwell uh, uh, from Washington and, and, and whoever your local representative are. You can direct those kind of questions to them and in so doing, you can make the case for why those affiliate rules are defeating the ultimate objective of the bill, which as Tom and, and I have talked about previously is really to keep people employed during an incredibly difficult time in the country. So that's not a very satisfying definitive answer to the question I know, but uh, we are sort of building this airplane as we go. And so I would, I would commend you to, to try it out with, uh, with the folks that are actually administering the loans. They will have very specific information uh, uh, about how those rules are supposed to be applied. And then if you think the rules don't work and, and the objective is to keep people on payrolls, uh, uh, then make the case through your local congressman or, or senator uh, uh, that those rules ought to be changed. Thank you. Let's go to Peter Schrappen. Peter, if you unmute yourself, please feel free to ask your question. Peter, are you there? I okay, think well, I saw Peter's question in the Q&A, which was, are 501c6 and c4 uh, nonprofit organizations eligible uh, for the Paycheck Protection Program? And it's something we've been looking at at the Downtown Seattle Association, and our understanding is no, that's not the case. And there are some efforts nationally and uh, across uh, states and regions uh, to advocate in the next stimulus that 501c4 and c6 nonprofits are eligible. Uh, as the bill was written, uh, 501c3s are the only nonprofits that are currently eligible for stimulus funding. So I hope I got that question right, Peter. Uh, it's something that we're looking at as well. Okay, let's go to another Howard. Howard Cohen. Um, Please feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. So uh, you spoke earlier about need, and I'm curious if need is based on the individual business entity or its parent company, and also how does that determine uh, forgiveness of loans? Great question. The um, it's it's. It, the banks um, asked for clarity on that and, and were told that we can rely on the applicants um, attesting to their statement that they need funds. And it's, it's literally that simple. And that's promulgated on the SBA's website where they have um, uh, you know, a statement to that effect. And, and so um, now how do you then deal with affiliates and parent companies? That's the other question we've gone back to the SBA to clarify um, so, so we can follow the rules correctly and, and manage expectations so that if, if we know what will qualify for forgiveness and, and what won't. So just to follow up on that, when I haven't seen the application yet, we're going to do that later, but when you do get involved with that, does that, um, do you get involved in actually showing your balance sheet or is it more just expenses? No, um, it's, uh, it's, it's to, you have to document your payroll um, to the bank so that we can calculate your average monthly payroll um, and, and use that to size the loan. But you don't have to document a drop in revenue or, or anything like that. Okay. Application wants to see number of employees too, I believe. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let's go to Jeffrey Nelson. Jeffrey, if you unmute yourself, you can ask your question. Thank you. Um, I'm curious how independent contractors uh, that we regularly use in our business and have used historically factor into the monthly um, calculation of average um, salary and average employee count and whether independent contractors can be included in that calculation. Thanks for your time. Uh, that's a great question. Um, 
when when we have that answer, I don't have it for you right now. Uh, we'll put it on our on our FAQ uh, for everybody. Um, but that's. Uh, I thought I saw that somewhere that independent contractors were not included in the employee count. No, but they they can make application on February fifteenth. Um, Independently. Mm -hmm. For Independent, themselves. Correct. Correct. Hey, but, AJ. But not be included in another business's employee count. Right. 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 You can't hear me. AJ. Yeah. Hey, it's Mark Costello from the SBA. Oh, hi, Mark. Hey. Um, yeah, that, that question is, is, um, detailed in the, the regulatory guidance and they indicate specifically that independent contractors would not be included, um, in the count of employees, but it, it strongly, uh, suggests that they themselves would be, uh, appropriate candidates for the uh, paycheck Protection Program, if that makes sense. Oh, good. I'm glad I understood it that way. <laughs> yeah. And thank you for joining us, uh, Mark. Mark Costello is the Deputy District Director for Seattle's SBA office and is also available for questions during our Q&A period here. Appreciate you being on the line, Mark. Thank you, John. Okay, let's go to Julia. Bebo. Julia, if you unmute yourself, you can ask your question. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Actually, this is perfect timing. Excellent follow-up question here to the one that was just asked. So uh, like the previous gentleman, our business relies on subcon independent subcontractors a lot for operation. And while I, I understand the logic that they're not employees, in a sense, our business can't operate without paying those people to function for us. So the most easiest being bookkeeping, right? Or, or taxes or you know accounting, um, but even more essential services for our business as well. So I'm just kind of wondering how the SBA is thinking about those that yes, those people can apply for their own loan, but yet that doesn't help me get their services because I need to pay them still to have those services which are essential to my business. So it's more, it's almost like they're an operating in expense. Right, right. I, yeah, I joined just in time. Um, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, so this is Mark Costello. I think you're right uh, in, in that I believe there are going to be different, uh, there's going to be a distinction between somebody who is, for example, uh, I think the kind of of contractors that were are contemplated in the regulations are full time contractors that work for a company. I think maybe what you're alluding to is somebody that is providing services on a limited basis and um, I think there's a, a difference there, um, but I'm not quite sure how to how to get to the bottom line on that. Are are you kind of suggesting that that you guys don't have regular employees? Can you still hear me? Yeah, I can. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So we we generally do operate like like many um, businesses in the tech sector, uh, with yeah. the majority of folks that that work for us are actually independent contractors, um, and so like I said, with without them, like ironically, since we're a digital business, a virtual business anyway, like it's potentially we're still a very viable business, and yet um, in this situation. Um, but yet I can't operate my business if I can't pay those folks to do the services for me. Where, so if they, in a sense, go and apply for their own payroll protection as an independent contractor, like, then do they just work for me for free? Like, I, that, I mean, that's where it gets really kind of weird, you know, like, okay, like, I think the goal is that they get money, right? Uh, that everybody's able to live. Um, but how that money flows to them affects whether my business can operate. And ultimately, if my business, I'm their yeah. primary provider of work, if my business ultimately fails, then 
in the long run, they're not going to get paid. <laughs> hey, Julia. Yeah. Julia, how about this? Um, would you mind uh, maybe sending me a follow-up email? Sure. Um, so, I, again, I'm Mark Costello with the Small Business Administration, and it's mark.costello at sba.gov. And, and what I'll do is forward that up the... Uh, the chain of command and and present it as either something that uh, you know we're hopeful that we could get some additional uh, clarification of how the existing regs might accommodate you or alternatively that bringing it to somebody's attention that hey this could be a gap uh, that we didn't uh, contemplate that needs to be addressed and and so the regulations or or the subsequent uh, policy okay. guidance needs to include this what, what are you talking about? okay great I, I, yeah, I think it's probably a pretty common situation in the startup yeah. uh, tech community so I think that yeah you know addressing it for me would address it for a lot of people um, just real yeah, quick mark I'm sorry is it mark with a C or a K for your email? oh it, it's mark you know, yeah mark, we gonna mark with a K yeah. Okay, and do you mind spelling okay. your last name as well? Sure, you bet, Julia. It's C O S T E L L O. Great. Okay, thank you. I'll, yeah. I'll drop that. It's a great. Too. It's just a great question, and the way that you presented it makes perfect sense. So uh, I would like to be able to to move that forward and get you some kind of consideration. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. Great. Let's go to Paul Labar. Paul, if you unmute yourself, you can ask your question. Great, thank you. Uh, this is also a question for Mark. Um, I'm, I'm really interested to better understand, given that the incentive, you know, both for the government and for the banks is, is to maximize the number of people who they're keeping from, from becoming unemployed. Uh, it seems that there's a bias towards larger companies in, in terms of less administrative uh, effort um, you know, perhaps fewer applications filled um, and, and more grants given with larger companies. Um, can you just comment on whether that's going to be a real bias and how things play out and how smaller companies might be able to compete if that bias uh, exists? Yeah, Paul, um, you know, I'd like to think not. And, and I guess the way that from my perspective, so I come from a background of SBA lending and working with uh, community banks and regional banks and national banks that, that have focused on serving small businesses specifically uh, over the years with SBA guaranteed loan products. And, and I know uh, my, my impression is that, that um, these are folks that have small business clients that that really are are going to provide the same level of 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 service and and commitment uh, to those clients, really regardless of of kind of where they sit on the on the scale of of you know number of employees and and things of that nature. So I guess what I'm saying is. Um, what we're advising people to do kind of along the lines of what Tom suggested uh, is, hey, if you have a bank of account, that's kind of your starting point. And it really shouldn't matter uh, whether you're a, a, a sole operator or a sole contributor, or if you're a, 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 you know, a manufacturing firm that employs 125 people. Um, I'm confident that the, the folks that have relationships with the lenders that, that we work with are gonna receive uh, an equivalent level of focus and service uh, in the delivery of this program. I think one of the things that, that uh, I guess just as a kind of backing up into some of the, from some of the comments that were made earlier, um, this is going to be a, a uh, a popular product and and maybe the early indications that we're seeing are that 
that the money is going to go quickly now um so what i what i just recommending to people is have that initial contact with your lender like the the folks at at washington federal who are already kind of queued up and ready to go um i think that's really really important um the the amount of work that's going to go into putting one of these together from the perspective of a lender uh, should be fairly limited. And, and again, I just, I think that I, I personally, from, from my observation of how our small business lending community operates, uh, there, there is not going to be a preferential uh, orientation as to how they're going to distribute these funds. Great, Thank, thanks for that, Mark. And, and sure thing, Paul. With, with regards to just the standard SBA applications um, before the, the CARES Act, do you have any advice on, on follow-up? Um, if you've already got one in um, and you're not seeing any communications, is there a way to get the SBA's attention and just get some feedback or are they just simply backlogged with communication? Yeah, that's a great question. So are you talking about like a, a regular, uh, SBA guaranteed loan, like a 7A loan or a 504 loan? No, I'm actually talking about the economic disaster recovery loan. Ah, so, okay, yeah. got it, yeah. got it. Yeah. yeah, gosh, I have to, that seems like it was a long time ago. It was like a week ago. <laughs> it was, that was, a it was about yeah. 10 years ago. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so, so do you have, you have a, a, a pending application in right now? We do, yeah. We have a loan number, okay. and I, I'd be happy to spit did it you, out if I knew you guys. Would. Well, let me <laughs> hey, let me ask you this: did Did sure. you put in for the Did you put in for that uh, the ten thousand dollar quick cash advance? Uh, yes, I believe we did. Excellent. There's, there's okay. Definitely plans so this is all yeah. good news. This is all good news. So what what you're going to be able to do, and this is one of the things that we were kind of waiting for, waiting to see, was how the two programs were going to sort of relate to one another when the, the Paycheck Protection Program rules were put out. Um, and I think Tom probably could could echo this, but but it, it seems like there's really gonna be, uh, there's no adverse impact uh, for, a, for a borrower who has gone ahead, uh, take, put in for the $10,000 quick cash advance, has a pending application for a larger economic injury disaster loan. You can go ahead with the Paycheck Protection Program application process and, and in ultimately determining that loan amount, the pending uh, EIDL uh, disaster loan application may be incorporated into it uh, to be refinanced. And there's, a, there's some math that they're going to do with respect to the $10,000 uh, quick cash advance, but it's it's not going to impair your uh, or impede your ability to pursue the paycheck protection program, and 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 so ultimately, uh, if if you decide that hey that's the direction you want to go and you really don't want to pursue the remainder of that economic injury disaster loan, you don't have to. Obviously, for a lot of people, the opportunity to get this. Uh, this funding, the the lion's share of which should be forgiven, forgivable debt. We don't really call it a grant, but um, that that's going to be a superior uh, option uh, versus the uh, the debt characteristics of the economic injury disaster loan. That obviously, other than the ten thousand, you you will have to pay back. So, and, and Mark, so you're can in I good, you're in good shape? Can I add something to, uh, uh, and feel free to correct me, but I've also heard that um, for folks that have applied to the disaster loan, because they changed the application up, I think, early this week to, to really do a good job of streamlining it. Um, uh, and for folks that applied to the IDLE, the disaster loan before that, they would have to apply again to access that $10,000 advance which is forgivable. Um, and and yes. on that piece, I've, I also understand that that advance would come within three days. Um, and even if the, the, your, your disaster loan, um, you know, whether you are successful or not, or whether you get approved for it or not, you would still not have to repay that $10,000 yeah. advance. Yes, 
Yeah, that, so it that's would be exactly good for right. folks to pursue that disaster loan application regardless, just to access that ten thousand um, dollars. And then, if I also understand correctly, the disaster loan, if you utilize, I mean, I guess there's two routes there. You could either roll it over into the into the the PPP, or you could utilize it, uh, segregate it. Um, to non-payroll costs because the PPP would be focused on the payroll costs. That's exactly right, uh, AJ. And I think the other thing too is the PPP, you know, us with our acronyms, I think we're, we're now calling it the P3. Anyway, the, the PPP um, really contemplates a, an eight week time, time horizon um, or maybe 10 weeks, but it's eight weeks of, of payroll. Um, the economic injury disaster loan is is looking at operating costs over a six month time frame. So, you know, there there are definitely pros and cons, but obviously money that 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 is uh, not going to be required to be paid back uh, certainly needs to be pursued. But but there would be nothing wrong with with an approach of of pursuing both of these products and coming up with the best combination that that. Uh, is going to work, you know, optimally for for your particular situation. Like, like for Julia's issue, you know, maybe the disaster loan might be a better resource because since the PPP is payroll focused, um, she might be able to get more out of the disaster loan. Um, and then maybe the SBA explores some aspect of, you know, there's a gap in because she doesn't technically have people on payroll but she has an expense that go to people that are getting paid. So maybe there's some exception um, that yeah. SBA can explore to, you know, if your expense is contractor related, then that might, you know, consider, be considered um, yeah. a, a forgivable piece. Right, right. No, I agree. I agree. Let's go to Kaylee Vinoski. Kaylee, if you unmute yourself, you can ask your question. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thanks all for being here today. really appreciate this and have found it super helpful. Um, I saw a couple questions in the Q&A, and so I work in real estate, and so this is kind of a weird situation for us. And based on the last answer, Mark, it sounds like we might be better suited for an EIDL loan, but um, in, in a lot of cases, we, we pay. So on our income statements, we are paying payroll for the management companies that operate our properties. Um, so that's, that's an expense on our balance sheet. Um, but we are not, we, we don't directly employ them. Like they get a W-2 from someone else. So our question is really how to, how to be thinking about this and how to optimize our application um, for, these, for, for these proceeds that are available. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great question, and it probably kind of goes uh, dovetails in a little bit with the one from Paula. Um, but I think you're right. If if I was looking at this and I was looking for the the clearest path, uh, I would look to the EIDL because it gives you an opportunity to simply look at your operating costs, um, whatever those might happen to be, and if they happen to be paying somebody who is an employer, an employee of of somebody else. Uh, but it's part of what you need to do, uh, you know, on a uh, regular basis as part of your your business operations. That is going to qualify under that economic injury disaster loan framework. They're going to look. They're going to ask you basically, hey, what are your monthly costs uh, to include payroll and other expenses such as rent and and utilities and all those different things? But in your case, you have a business model. Where, where those are clearly legitimate expenses. Uh, they're not employees, but they're costs of your operation. And, and I would suggest that, that they would fit well uh, in that economic injury disaster loan framework and calculation, so. The, the difference there being that only 10,000 of the disaster loan would be forgivable. Exactly, exactly. But I would say too, and, and I'm, I'm not trying to uh, pitch the economic injury disaster loan over the paycheck protection, but just, just so everybody's aware of some of the features of that product, um, 
first of all, it's a it's not a one percent interest rate. It's a three point seven five fixed rate. It's got a built in twelve month deferment feature whereby you wouldn't have to make any payments on the loan for a year after receiving the funds. And the uh, the loans are going to be structured out over either fifteen or thirty years, fully amortizing. So really, the idea here is is it's I mean the logic behind it is very similar in my mind to what we're what we're doing with the paycheck protection program is to get money out right now to businesses uh, so that they can sustain themselves until such time as we return to some economic normalcy uh, and and then at the end of that not to put them in a situation where they're going to be excessively burdened with uh, with that debt obligation. I think the, the EIDL does a nice job of making that obligation as manageable as possible with those terms that I described. Great, thank you. Howard Cohen, did you have another question? I did, and I know this wasn't discussed, but it falls into somewhat of this conversation and I'm wondering if you are able to speak at all about the employer social security tax that is supposed to be forgiven if you fall under 50% of your revenues quarter by quarter over year or deferred until the end of next year and the end of the following year. Uh, are you aware of that uh, ruling? This is for employer social security, not employee social security. So the 6.2% that the employer pays. I, I'm not familiar. Okay, it's not familiar. All right, that's another tax benefit or tax ease for the, for the companies. There were a number of questions in the Q&A box that we haven't gotten to, but our commitment is to uh, do our best to go through those and populate an FAQ and, and uh, take the FAQ that Tom has uh, been developing as well with his colleagues at Wafed Bank and to share that out with you. I want to conclude our uh, virtual access event today and just thank uh, Mark, AJ, uh, Tom and Frank and all of you for joining us. Uh, our website is continuously updated with resources uh, and we are also tracking the economic impact in downtown and I invite you to follow us on our social media channels as well. We will continue with this event series. I invite you to share this out with the invitations out with other companies, organizations that you think may have interest, whether they're DSA members or not. We're opening the walls of a tent and we want everybody to benefit from this knowledge and this access so that we can help uh, each of you, small businesses and nonprofits and other businesses in our downtown get back on your feet as fast as possible. We will follow up with a survey and, and uh, really appreciate your feedback uh, on that uh, survey. And if there are additional topics, individuals, content that you think would be valuable uh, as we collectively uh, work to get through this uh, difficult and challenging period and get our downtown and city back on its feet. Uh, with that, thank you again for joining us. I hope you have a great rest of your Friday, a terrific weekend, and that you stay safe and healthy.